Hey, good morning, church family. Thanks for being here with us live this morning at Ecclesia Christian Church. We want to say happy Pentecost. Today is the day in church history when we remember that first gospel sermon that the apostle Peter preached. The gates to the kingdom were opened up. He invited all people who were gathered in Jerusalem for this feast to come and hear and accept the message that Jesus Christ had resurrected. He had paid the penalty for their sins and they could be saved. They could be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of their sins to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is what we are talking about today. So if you have not already, I want to encourage you, open up your Bible real quick this morning and read Acts chapter 2, because that has the whole account of this event that we are recognizing and remembering today. And if you're familiar with that, that's going to really help you follow the sermon, because Pastor Matt is going to bring us all the way from Old Covenant to New, and he is going to show us how all this was planned by God, this idea of a adopting all people to sonship as his children was in the mind of God before the foundations of the world. Beautiful picture in scripture that we are diving into today. 
This past week, we also celebrated the birthday of this local congregation, Ecclesia. We launched as a church on June the 1st, 2014. So we are eight years old now. Happy birthday, church. Happy birthday to this congregation and to the Lord's Worldwide Church. We are honoring that today for Pentecost. Now, if you are watching and you are within driving distance, I want to invite you to come in person today from 4 to 6 p.m. We as a congregation are going to be down at the Conway Riverwalk, the riverfront park and there we are going to have some music and some food we're going to have another short Pentecost message and many people are choosing to be baptized today that is something that we saw take place in this Pentecost account on Acts chapter 2 3,000 people heard the message that Peter preached that day and they were baptized in the name of Jesus which was a really big deal and Pastor Matt's going to explain why and we offer that invitation to everyone here who's ready to make that step today it's a great day to start brand new with Jesus so come and join us at the Riverfront Park if you can do that. Again, we'll be there from 4 to 6 p.m. today. Everyone is welcome to come be part of that service. We're going to kick off our service with a, some worship here in just a minute. We're going to have a time of communion around the Lord's table. We invite you to participate in that wherever you're watching from. And then we are going to jump into this message about Pentecost so theologically rich, so many fulfillments that we see in this passage that we're digging into today. Man, I love it. I can't wait for you to hear it. So we are going to get ready to head into worship now, and then I'll see you right back here at the end. Meet me here, and let's unpack that message. See you guys soon. Let's go worship. the God who gives, the God who always makes a way.
Amen. Oh, y'all ain't ready. Amen. Amen. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You want to see something? This is when we come around the Lord's table to partake of the bread that is his body, to partake of the cup, which is his blood. If you didn't get communion on your way in today, raise your hand. Don't miss this. Be a part of this, especially today, Pentecost Sunday, the birthday of the church, where and when it all started. I was thinking this morning, me and Matt were talking, and, and you know, in the Old Testament, there was a sacred bread. There's always been a, a sacredness in things for God. But in the Old Testament, there was a sacred bread, and it was only for the priests, and it was kept in the back. And the people couldn't approach the bread. They couldn't partake of this sacred bread. And I just want you to think this morning as we do this together, not only about the body of Christ, not only about his blood that was shed, but I want you to consider this morning the day of Pentecost, the moment that everything changed, the moment that the sacred bread became the holy lamb of God. The moment that the sacred bread became the holy bread for me and you, that Jesus said, if you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have life, and that life, I promise, is eternal. You see, everything changed. That moment, if you will, from where it was for the priest only to where God said, you are a royal priesthood. You are my people. And so today as we partake, as we remember, as we reflect, as we analyze our lives, and we say, Father, is what I'm doing pleasing to you? Are we the church that you've called us to be? I want you to realize who you are and who he's sending you for. Amen? Father, we love you so much. We're so thankful. We're overwhelmed, Lord, with humility because of who we see ourselves as, knowing who you see us as. Father, lead us in the paths that you want us to walk. Help us to lead others around us, Father. And help us to always be drawing others closer to your son, Jesus, the holy bread, the sacred bread of our life that gives us life until we can do it with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. darkest day in history there on a cross they made for sinners for every curse his blood atoned one final breath and it was finished but not the end we could have known for the earth began to shake and the realness came. What sacrifice was made? As a
Good morning and welcome to Ecclesia Christian Church. My name is Tabitha and I'm here to give you lots of upcoming events. First, this afternoon at 4 p.m., we're meeting at the Conway Riverfront Marina. We are going to have hamburgers and hot dogs. We're going to have a word from Pastor Matt and most importantly, we're going to have baptisms. If you would like to participate in any way, please text Pentecost to our number so that we can be prepared. Also, if you plan to be baptized, we suggest you bring water shoes and a towel. Everyone else, please bring a dessert to share and a chair to sit on. Next up, let's talk about core class. Starting June 20th, 6.30 p.m. Monday nights for five weeks, skipping July 4th, we would like to invite you to participate in learning all the core values of Ecclesia. This is a required class if you plan to lead a team or serve in any way of leadership. Please text CORE to our number to register. Now, let's please welcome Pastor Matt. All right, you guys ready? So I want to share something with you guys that I think um, as we are harvest workers that go out and we are sent, and we pray for others to be sent to be able to go and share the gospel, to be able to walk in discipleship, and to be able to build God's kingdom. One of the things that I've found that's powerful for me, and I hope it is for you, 
It's a simple prayer. And it's, it's nothing so stupendous you can't remember it, but it's just something for me. And I, I, hope, it's, I hope it can do the same for you. If you will close your eyes and, and we'll do this together. Um, starts like this. Father, thank you for the opportunity to share in your word and in your kingdom. But I ask you today, Father, take my, take my life, take control, and let your spirit guide everything I say and I do. Father, bind me and stop me from anything that could not be glorifying to you. But God, only allow what comes from me to be in submission to you, according to your will, your word, and your spirit. And Father, I pray that if in some way I can impact someone today and be a light to them to where they can see you, and God, magnify yourself in anything I can do. And if there's something that keeps me from drawing people to you, then Father, magnify yourself in my weakness. In Jesus' name, amen. Something, something to remind us through the day, it's not us. It's not what we can do. It's not our, our power. It's through him. Because there is a point of the devil knows really well how to get us caught in ourself. We can start out in Jesus, and then we can get to ourselves really quickly. It's really easy to take credit for what God does, even, even in the lowliest of things. Um, uh, for a long time, I used to pride myself, catch that, used to pride myself on being the guy that took the trash out. And then God sent John Wodzinski, and John Wodzinski would start rushing to get the trash before I could get it. And so... I prided myself on being that guy. Nobody could ever say that I was above anything because I'm going to take the trash out. And so John started, do, he started taking my trash. And I'd be like, we'd be after church, and I'd be running, trying to go to the trash. And, and John would move faster, and he would get the trash out faster. And so finally one day, I would grab a trash bag, and I would run out, and John looked at me, and, and this isn't word for word, but pretty much what John said was, you touch that trash one more time, and I'm not coming back to church. He said, this is how I serve. And I'm like, it's how I serve. He says, you preach, I'll take the trash. And, and I realized, why am I upset somebody else is wanting to do what I'm doing? Why am I upset somebody else is wanting to take the trash out, wanting to serve? And, and, and there's a thing in that. There's always more trash. I can go get some trash. If I really want to take the trash out, I can come to your house and take the trash out. You know what I mean? Just got to do it with your permission. Tuesdays. Um, but, but one of the things that we can get so proud of being a servant, we can get so proud of doing things for God, that the pride of that overtakes the, the service of it, and it overtakes the glory of God. And in Jesus' time, that's a lot of what happened. So you had thousands of years of prophecies pointing towards Jesus, and then 400 years of a gap and Jesus comes, and in that 400 years, not only did they have the prophecies and the word of God, but they had added to, and they had taken the law further, and they had come to a place to where they had added so many pieces to the law to where it was impossible. And Jesus is constantly coming under attack from them because he's trying to fulfill the law, but he's not good enough for where they've got the law. And they're so devoted to things that aren't even from the Holy Spirit, they're not from God, but they are cultural and traditional tra things that have been added into their faith. Ever wonder why Jesus made mud to heal the blind man? We've got all kinds of speculations and teachers, but according to the additional Hebrew teachings at that time, they had made it a sin to even mix mud on the Sabbath. So Jesus was breaking a man-made law to show God's law was sovereign. And it was more important to do good on the Sabbath. So we look at that as kind of like, oh, he's rebellious. He's just breaking the law, breaking the law. Somebody's from the 80s. But Jesus was trying to show God's word in the proper context is more important than the traditions and desires of men and what we would fight for. Jesus could not live up to the standards of the religious people of his day, and they crucified him. He wasn't what they wanted. And so today, as we look at Christianity, I want to share something with you. I'm wearing my Marty McFly shoes today because we got to do some time traveling. Because what happens is throughout time, we get to a place to where, if you look, the church was exploding after Jesus. So 
From Genesis to Jesus, we've got this beautiful projection of God's plan, God's will, and the prophecies lined up. And then we've got this gap before Jesus' time to where people kind of sit and create their own interpretations of it. And then when Jesus comes, he's fulfilling it, getting it back together, and the church is blossoming and going, and the church is beautiful. And then persecution hits, and the church gets even better. And then the government looks at it and says, hey, we like the power of this thing and we'd like to bring it into the government. And then church becomes a government institution and then it becomes really powerful and people get to kind of work with it, change it and put their their twist on it. And then we got a man named Martin Luther who says, hey, there's stuff in this that doesn't line up. And he doesn't have all the history. He doesn't have all the manuscripts. He doesn't have every piece. And so he comes out the best he can. And then from him, people start shooting off in different directions from him of interpretation and beliefs, and they don't have all the archaeological evidence, and they don't have all the history, and sometimes it's preference, and sometimes it's the best of intentions. And so today, we have so many traditions and customs that are American-born in our faith, but we accept them because it's the way it's been done in our lifetime and our parents' lifetime. We forget to trace back and start saying, when did this start? Where did it come from? Does it go all the way back? Or are we going back in time, taking that scripture and making it fit the beliefs we have today, instead of going back to what God had originally destined and making ourselves fit it? If you're a Back to the Future fan and Back to the Future 2, anybody in here with me? (laughs) Okay, because I know there's some people here above that, but if you... Biff has taken the All Sports Almanac and gone back and set a different timeline, and we got to go back to 1955, and we got to set things straight. Are you all with me? We need to be the church Christ established. The church Christ established did not come out of anything. It was found in the foundations of Genesis. It was always God's plan. It is the fulfillment of God's plan, and it is the promise and the hope of the world. So today is the day of Pentecost. Now, This is something, churches love Christmas and they love Easter and we love celebrating those days and that's like the two big ones of the church. But really, Pentecost is the big one of the church. It's just not talked about a lot because certain denominational groups have grabbed it, clasped it, and there are certain things that people are emotionally and traditionally and culturally tied to that scares everybody else to the point where we don't want to talk about the Holy Spirit. We don't want to talk about Pentecost. We're scared to death of what they mean. Let's break it down. Pentecost is the Greek way of looking at the 50-day period from Passover to Pentecost to the harvest day or the Feast of Weeks. So let's look at Passover and Pentecost and let's break it like this. Passover was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Pentecost was the Feast of Weeks, the weeks that had taken place between the first fruits of the harvest on Wave Sheaf Day being presented to God and the harvest celebration of God's people all coming together as a family and being able to celebrate what God has done. Now, let's break down a little bit, going backwards into Passover. Um, So they're the two biggies of the Jewish faith, but Passover comes from the time the Israelites were in Egypt. So you can go to the book of Exodus. Genesis leaves off. Joseph has gone into Egypt. The people are taken care of, and we start an exodus of there's been slavery, there's been persecution, there's been death and bondage for the Israelites, and God's going to send a deliverer. Just like we come into Matthew with Jesus, God is sending a promised deliverer that hears the cries of his people that's going to lead them out. Just like Moses performed signs and wonders, Jesus performed signs and wonders. Just like Moses leads them through the Red Sea and 1 Corinthians 10 says they were baptized into the cloud as the Holy Spirit guides us and defends us, the cloud guide and led them to the sea as Peter said, the source of all life and creation, there's our creator and to their Moses, their deliverer as we see Jesus, our deliverer, the great commission, Jesus says, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we see this continuance, this beautiful picture, but for them to come out For them to have this deliverance, there has to be a Passover. Now, we read in the Passover, Jesus is celebrating with his disciples, and that's where we get the Lord's Supper. It's where we get communion or sacrament, however you want to call it. But the beauty of this is Jesus is celebrating this Passover feast that is lamb, bitter herbs, salt, 
un- unfermented wine, uncontaminated wine, and he's celebrating with uncontaminated bread, bread without yeast that has to be pierced and broken. And in the midst of this, this wine is purity. It represents the blood of the lamb. So let's understand this. A lamb had to be slaughtered. The angel of death is the final sign through Exodus to where God's going to shake up Egypt so they let God's people go. And so God has performed miracle and sign after sign, but the Pharaoh's heart is hardened, and God says, I will send my final one. The angel of death will come through. And the firstborn sons of Egypt will die. But here is grace. I'm going to give grace. Salvation. If you sacrifice the lamb and you put its blood, you cover your doorpost. If you're covered under the blood of the lamb, the angel of death will pass by. But if you reject that, he won't. That's where they get Passover. The angel of death will pass over this house. Same as Jesus, we are washed in the blood of the lamb and death passes over us. That is grace. And so in this, they would take the lamb that was slaughtered and they would consume that lamb, that lamb and it was the sacrificial lamb and then they would have this bitter herb that reminded them of their bitter years in slavery. And they would have salt and the salt would remind them of the tears that had been wept. And they would have Un, 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 unfermented or, 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 or pure wine, we would call it juice today. And they would drink that because it was not contaminated, it was pure like the blood of the lamb. And they would take bread that was undefiled, without yeast. And this bread that, if you've ever had a saltine cracker, you notice the holes in it because it has to be pierced to cook. And Jesus says to his disciples later, this is my body which would be pierced, which will be broken for you. And in the midst of this, Jesus takes away the lamb because he becomes the lamb. He takes away the bitter herbs because he's cleansing us of the sins. He takes away the salt because we have no need for the tears because we will be in him. And he keeps the pure wine that is his pure blood of the new covenant that is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And he takes the bread and says, this is my body. And so as you remember, I'm fulfilling Passover because I'm taking the place of these things. And so when Jesus is with his disciples, they have been celebrating, people have been celebrating this Passover for so long because this Passover is reminding them of their past, of slavery, of bondage, but also this, they had to take a lamb and sacrifice it at Passover They would take the lamb and they would bring it before the people or they would bring it to the temple and they would have it sacrificed. Now, in in our minds, we kind of see this lamb and it's it's simple. You know, animal sacrifice, you take a a lamb, you've sinned, you take it to the temple, they they kill it, sacrifice it, you sins or atone for for a year and anything you've done wrong is kind of good and it's kind of like this nice little button up thing, but that's, that's not what it was like at all. You, you didn't go to IGA and pick up some lamb chops. You didn't go to a, a farm and just buy a lamb. See, this lamb had to be a firstborn lamb. It had to be a firstborn of firstborn. It had to be without blemish. It had to be without defect. It couldn't have a scar. It couldn't have broken, bruised bones. You know how hard it is to have a firstborn lamb out of a group that's going to be a male? Let me just put it like this. As humans, I have seven kids. Six of those are girls, and the boy was nowhere near number one. Which means by the time my son was born, if he was a lamb, there's no way he would have been able to work. So that would mean even at seven kids in 18 years, I would not have produced a sacrificial child. So for you to have a sacrificial lamb, this was a process. And when one was born and it was right and it didn't have blemish or defect, you had to preserve this lamb because it could never get scarred. It could never be broken. It could never have anything like that. And so do you know what they would do? They would wrap it up tight because when babies were born, we're in that fetal position and we're like, meh, meh. we don't talk yet, but we're cooing and we're grabbing and we just want skin on skin contact and we just want to sleep and maybe every now and then get a little stretch and then come back in. Not lambs. Lambs are born and they're like, well, let's go. They're ready to move. And so a lamb will thrash about. So they'll take that swaddling cloth and they'll wrap that lamb up. It's got to be soft because they can't let it get damaged. They'll wrap it up softly. 
And then they'd take like a manger and they would fill it with hay or something soft and they would nestle after they've tied up this lamb tight. They would lay it down so that if it did get loose, it would start bumping the hay instead of bumping something hard because it cannot be bruised or broken. It can have no scars. When Jesus was born, the shepherds were told in Bethlehem, a sign is given to you that is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. It wasn't customary practice for you to go to a feeding trough and lay your newborn in it. So when the shepherds would see this, they would not just see a baby. They would see the promised Messiah that would die for the sins of the world. They would understand, looking at this baby, what his purpose was. They would understand, he is born among us, he must be raised among us, and he must maintain his purity. You with me so far? So Jesus, at this Passover time when these lambs would be sacrificed, I want you to understand, all of the prophecies, even down to the ceremonial acts that are taking place, are lining up to show Jesus at this time. At Passover, as Jesus is coming, he has, he has preached, he has performed miracles, he has reached people and loved people, and now he's to a place to where the final week is at hand, and he starts doing something different. When people would say, are you the Messiah? He would answer them with questions. When people would ask if he's the one they're waiting for, he would be vague. He would escape them if they tried to seize him. But this final week, Jesus is making sure everything lines up perfectly. The night that he's going to give his body and blood, the final night that he's with his disciples when he will be arrested, he doesn't even tell his disciples where he's going to have the Last Supper. He has it prearranged. They're looking for a specific man with a water jug on his head. Something stands out about a man with a water jug on his head because that was women's work. He would have been dressed like everybody else, but Jesus doesn't let any of his disciples know where they're going to be until the last minute. Why? Because one of them's a snitch. Judas is going to betray him. He cannot be arrested at the wrong time. And he doesn't tell any of his disciples because they could tell Judas. And then if you look at the, at, the, at the Passover feast he's celebrating with his disciples, you don't see servants attending. Jesus is the one washing feet. Jesus is the one that's serving. Why? Because servants can be bribed. It has to be maintained because there's a specific time and way everything must happen. And then when the moment is right, he looks at Judas and says, do what you must do quickly. Because the time, the time, my time is at hand. My time has come. See, Jesus is arrested. During the Passover, multiple things would happen. A lot of times people just think about sacrificial lambs. But the Passover was also the piece that set up for Pentecost. This Pentecost was going to come. Or the Feast of Weeks was going to come. So they would take the first fruits. And they would take the wheat and they would beat the wheat. And they would shake the chaff off of it, but it must be beaten. And so Jesus is arrested and brought in as the wheat would be beaten. And he was beaten. And you ever wonder why the religious leaders they are having Jesus crucified are not constantly in the presence of what's happening? Because they have religious duties. But what they don't realize is as Jesus is beating and they're going to go perform their duties, instead of beating this wheat, the true sacrifice is over here being beaten for us. And then, as the sacrificial lambs are to be slaughtered, they got to leave and go sacrifice the lambs as Jesus, our sacrificial lamb, is being sacrificed on the cross, perfectly lining up. They just can't see it because they don't want to. It's happening. Everything is being fulfilled right in front of them, piece to piece, piece to piece. Everything that God had established thousands of years ago are now happening right in front of them, but they can't see it. But it was perfect. And then after Jesus Christ would resurrect on the third day, we know this is the Lord's day because it would be wave sheaf day. It would be Sunday. And Jesus would be resurrected on the same day that we would come and bring the first fruit offering to God. And it would be presentable so that all offerings could be presentable to God. And then on Pentecost, we would bring in the best so that all people and God's family could dine together and be celebrated like there's no difference. The birth of the church would take place. As we go through this, 
I think it's really important for us to understand that Romans 7, verse 7 through 12 states that the law produced death, not life for a nation. If we look at Pentecost, there was death in the lambs, and the Hebrew writer says that they have to again and again and again and again make sacrifices, but Jesus was a sacrifice once and for all for mankind. And in this, Jesus was buried. He was planted in the earth, and he would resurrect like the first fruits to give life just like all of us. Jesus looks at those in Jerusalem, and he tells his disciples, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. Therefore, let us pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers. The harvest is the day of Pentecost where all people will hear the gospel message for the first time where the church will be opened up. If you want to understand more because of time's sake, we've got some baptisms that are happening here today and at the river, but I want you to just have some scripture that you can go through and trace this out. If you want to understand the generosity of the time of, of Pentecost, Leviticus 23, 15 through 22, you can read that and it's about people bringing their offerings and their wave offerings and their burnt offerings to the Lord. But I think what's more important for us is understanding these offerings were meant for all people to be equal at one point. So maybe you had more than your neighbor and throughout the year you were able to live in luxury and still take care of those around you, but your neighbor was not as fortunate. At this time, you and your neighbor could both be in Jerusalem and all of this celebration included you and there was no rich and there was no poor and there was no better and there was no less, but all were equal at the table because they were dining in the presence of God. And their offerings were coming in. And their offerings were based off of percentage. So there was no greater gift. It was the same amount to each person, just not the same amount that was being brought. And so if a person's currency, if they had so much that they could not bring enough grain and wheat, they would sell it and bring the money, and then they would bring the money, and the money would be distributed to be able to take care of the food needs for the other people. But every person was making the equal sacrifice so that each person at this time could be equal in the presence of God. The reason this is so important for us today is because Jesus comes to make a sacrifice so that each person that comes to God can be equal. Now, a very important passage is John chapter 20. I want everyone to, to stay with me on this. John chapter 20. Go ahead and turn to it, mark it, and I want, you to, I want you to keep this as something for you. Because as Jesus dies on the cross, there is this fulfillment that must happen, and we see it throughout Pentecost and Passover. And in this moment, Jesus' commission was not just to die for the sins of the world. That's something in America we like to hold on to. We like this free salvation, free gift type thing. And I don't know about y'all, but if anybody in here ever had a child that had to die, you would never look at that as that child being a payment for someone else and call that free. And Jesus' call was for all people to deny themselves to come to him. I wouldn't call that free. I would call that covenant. Are you with me so far? And as we're looking at this, Jesus is the only son of God that is coming and dying. This isn't like a lamb. We, we are disassociated from a lamb, but most people in here probably have a puppy. And if you thought about your puppy having to die for the sins of the world, that would probably be harder for you. Because just like that lamb that was raised up in swaddling clothes, growing up among you, you have to protect it and nurture it and make sure that it's safe at all times until the time is right. And through this, you build a bond. Imagine you protecting your puppy, your dog, and that bond that's with you. And then knowing that this animal is going to die for you. And as you're carrying it, you've loved it, you've nurtured it, you've fed it. And as you're walking and traveling to the place, it will be sacrificed because you sinned it will die because you sin and as you walk up to the temple and you're getting ready to hand this over this dog this loved one this cherished person that's like a member of the family and you hear it bleeding for the last moments it was in design to impact you to think about the consequence of sin and even though there was affection for this animal it still wasn't you it still wasn't your child it still wasn't your children Jesus, God's son, is coming as a sacrifice for the world, to be a sacrifice. They'll offer life and hope. And in that lamb, as hard as it was to have that lamb, that was still only for this year. Jesus was once for all. He was going to open the door so that all people, 
through that great of a sacrifice can be equal to God. Jew, Gentile, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter our skin color. It doesn't matter our past political affiliation. It doesn't matter anything other than in this moment we can be cleansed and be equal to God, to God's, each other in God's kingdom. Now think about this. John chapter 20. This is going to be so important for us. Our current context that says this free gift has created, looking backwards, ways for us to just have the most limited, limited covenant with God possible. The limited, limited cost, limited consequence, everything. And so we've taken stories like the thief on the cross, and we say that day he went to be with Jesus in heaven. Sit for a second, don't get upset, let me explain. You have John chapter 20 in front of you. Jesus lived and died under the old covenant. In order to establish the new covenant fully, he had to die and then overcome sin and death and be presented to God as a blameless first fruits offering. That's why he is the first fruit to raise from the dead. Now, let's think about this for a second. Jesus tells the story that helps us understand the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross looks at Jesus and says, Lord, and he cries out, and we kind of exaggerate it a little bit, but he goes from mocking to defending, and he says, this man is innocent. We have sinned, but this man is innocent, and Jesus looks at him and says, I tell you the truth. Today you'll be with me in paradise, and we say, well, paradise sounds like heaven. Remember, Jesus has to die, overcome death, and then be presented before God. So what's missing here? Jesus tells the story of this man named Lazarus who is a poor beggar and a rich man. The rich man never gets his name told. And every day the beggar begs and the rich man lives his life. It doesn't say he's evil. It doesn't say he's grubby. It just doesn't say he does anything to help Lazarus. And one night both of them die and the angels take Lazarus to the bosom of Abraham into paradise and Lazarus, or the rich man, opens his eyes and he's in torment and hell. Throughout this story, this, this story that Jesus shares, there's never a point where God is mentioned as being there. Because sin has separated us from the presence of God. Now, some of you are still sitting there going, yeah, but I, man, I'm just saying. What would bring us back into the presence of God? One. A sacrifice that could atone for our sins must be made. Two, the first fruit of that offering must be presented before God can receive the rest of the harvest. That's, that's the prophecy of the law. That's the prophecy of Leviticus. And here's what happens. Jesus resurrects on the third day, on wave sheaf day, on the day the first fruits will be presented before God. At this day, Mary and some of Jesus' disciples believe he is dead, is looking for a dead Savior. Jesus said, in three days I'll rise. But they're not there looking for him resurrected. They're bringing spices to put on his dead body. And when they get there, the stones rolled away. You would think, yeah, you would think, hey, Jesus is alive, but she don't. They go into the tomb. There are shiny angels in there. And the angels say these words. Why look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's living. He's gone ahead just like he said. Now go tell his disciples. At that moment, angels speaking to you, people glowing in a cave should stand out. But our grief and our lack of faith can overwhelm us. So what does Mary do? She goes outside. Have you ever been at a point you're so distraught nobody can even understand what you're saying? Have you ever been to that point, you're so upset, you can't even make sense? And Mary comes to the presence of Jesus. Jesus is right there. She thinks he's the gardener. Have you ever realized maybe sometimes God is right there, and you're asking him where he's at, and he's like, right here. But where are you? I'm right here. It's when Mary sees the gardener, she's like, where they've taken my Lord. <laughs> Just tell me where you took him. Just tell me where you put him. And it's Jesus standing right. That's like saying, picking up your phone and saying, hey, Siri, where's my phone? It's John chapter 20 you're looking at because we're going to read scripture, but I got to rush through this so we can hear it all to get to the power. Jesus says, Mary. She says, Rabbi. If you really, really break this down, 
It's like she goes for him. And Jesus says these powerful words, do not hold on to me. I have not yet returned to my Father. Where's God? Our Father in heaven. I have not yet returned to my Father. What is the day? Wave sheaf day. What has to happen on this day? The first fruit offering has to be presented before God so that the rest of the offering can be acceptable to God. So he says, go and tell Peter and my disciples that I'm going to my father and your father, my God and your God. What's he saying? I will go present myself as the first fruit so that you can be accepted. Later, he meets his disciples all but one because there's always the one redneck that doesn't show up, Thomas. And then Thomas doesn't see Jesus, and so Thomas says, I refuse to believe until I can touch him. Mary tried to touch him. Jesus says no. Thomas says, I refuse to believe until I can touch him. Well, what does Jesus say when he comes back and sees Thomas? Touch me. Why? Because I have been to my Father. I have opened the door that has separated man. Sin closed it. I have opened it. I died. I overcame sin, death in the grave, and I was presented as acceptable to him. Therefore, mankind can be with my father again. The thief didn't go to heaven. He died under the old covenant law. The new covenant gospel was presented after Jesus' resurrection. And he gives the disciples this command. Go. Go. Make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28, 19. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Surely I'll be with you always to the end of time. When the Israelites came out, they were baptized into the cloud, into the sea, into the Spirit. And when Jesus had overcome and performed his final miracles on this, this life as him being the vessel here on earth, he says, now in me, my Father, and the Spirit. That's the commission. That's the call. See, the first, first Pentecost, after the first Passover with the sacrificial system being put in place, the first Pentecost takes place at Mount Sinai. And this is where God writes the Ten Commandments in stone. And when Moses is going to give the commands where God has written in stone, he goes down and finds that the people have been worshiping a golden calf and give up on God. According to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33, God would write his word in our heart. So on Sinai, the first Pentecost that's written in stone, on the Pentecost after Jesus' resurrection, when the church would be born, it would be written in our heart. God had chosen all of his people at that point to be a nation of priests, but when he comes, when they see that the people are worshiping a golden calf, the Levites rise up and start striking down those they are leading people astray, and 3,000 people die, and the Levites become the priests. On the day of Pentecost, when the gospel message is preached, 3,000 believe and are baptized and become a part of Christ's church. And we became, as Scripture would say in 1 Peter 2.9, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. There's something so beautiful in this. In John chapter 14, as Jesus is with his disciples, in verse 1 he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you that I would have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. For you know the way to the place where I'm going. Jesus is laying out something beautiful. And Thomas is like us. He wants GPS coordinates. And he says, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus says this, and we've got this on bumper stickers, shirts, Instagram posts, and we've got tracks. And every modern Christian has, has tried to make a little cute phrase for this. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And this is a Pentecost message that will be preached, but they don't understand 
fully yet. And we understand even less because we're not people that have lived our lives in a sacrificial system. If we can, we'll put a chart right here. And I'm going to move through this so that we can get it. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Our society's like, well, Jesus is the only way to heaven. And he tells the truth and as new life in Jesus. So that's what that meant. But to them, it would have meant something else. See, this is the layout of the temple, the same as was for the tabernacle. Jesus would have preached at the southern gates. Peter will preach at the southern gates. And as this is laying out, see, this temple is laid out into three sections. And the outer courtyard is called the way. The Jewish people would have known that as the way. And when Jesus says, I am the way, there is an altar here. And at this altar, your sacrifice is burned for your sins. It is slaughtered and it is burned and it dies for you. And then there is a sea of bronze. The sea of bronze was this massive mikvah. Today, we call it a baptismal. And on the southern gate, there would be 50 of these. But right inside the way, after an offering, a sacrifice was made to atone. You had to be cleansed. You had to be washed in water so that you could go into the holy place, the truth. And in the holy place, you found this unleavened bread that you could partake of if you were cleansed and holy and priestly. You would break it and partake. Jesus has already given that to his people. And there was a menorah, this candle, this light, the light of the world as Jesus called his people. That his priests can shine for all people. And there was an altar of incense as we live devoted holy lives that go up fragrantly before God. I will be your sacrifice. I am the way. I will be your sacrifice. You will pass through me. You will be cleansed in me just like Israelites through the sea. And in here you will become the light of the world. You will partake of me and you will be a fragrant offering a people for your God. In the last place, the life, the holy of holies, the presence of God where the Ark of the Covenant would sit, separated by a massive curtain that when Jesus died was tore from the top to the bottom. And this is God saying, and you are in the presence of me. This is Jesus saying, you are in the presence of my Father, I and him, and you and me, as I am in him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know me. Do this for others. Walk them in me and you will find your way to the Father. If you want to go to the Father, Jesus says, I'm going into the presence of my God. And through the sacrifice, through the washing, through the life, through the light of the world, through this fragrant life, we are in his presence. And that is the gospel right there. And so Jesus gives this to his disciples. He gives them the great commission. And then he says, I have to go so I can send my spirit to you. As he sends them after... 40 days of showing himself to over 500 people, preparing them. He tells them this dangerous thing. I'm going to send you now to Jerusalem where they crucified me. And now they're all upset because my tomb's empty and they don't know what to do. And the Romans are upset because they can't produce my body to show that they can actually keep me dead. And it's in, a, it's in an uproar. And their second biggest festival is coming up. And you know how these guys are when they get worried about somebody messing up their festival. And so I'm sending you. It's the most dangerous place you could go, and it's the most dangerous time. And I'm going to give you the most dangerous message. But my spirit, he will come, and here's what my spirit will do. He will lead you from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the world. That's what is promised from your comforter. As Jesus, 10 days, I can't imagine what it's like waiting in Jerusalem as, as the most wanted people, like in the most dangerous place, just waiting there, praying, fasting, just waiting. And then something happens unlike any other time. Something so beautiful. Fire. Bro, fire. Now, this sounds crazy to you and me because ain't none of us seen this because we weren't there and it's not our day. This ain't happened for us. Fire appears over their head. And the sound of a mighty rushing wind fills the room so loud that people from all over are coming, hearing the sound. They want to know what's going on. And then something amazing happens. They begin to be able to speak in the tongues of the people around them. As the people gather around them in bewilderment of what's going on, some people mock them. But people say, we hear them. Are not all these men Galileans, but we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our native 
languages. Why? Why is this happening? Because the gospel must go out. And this is the one time when people from every nation are gathered in Jerusalem. Over a million people from every place have come in. And the Bible lists them based off where they are. And the people come in are hearing the gospel in their language so they can take it as they leave and share it with the world. That was beautiful. And the Holy Spirit equipped them to be able to speak this, but that's not just his job. His job was to equip people in every generation to share the gospel as it's needed to be shared. You know what the great work of the Holy Spirit was there? 120 people that had been hiding and scared for just 10 days, standing out boldly at the most dangerous day, the most dangerous place, the most dangerous time, and listen to what they preach. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. It's the last passage. Peter has gone through the history to prove Jesus through the history because they didn't have the New Testament back then. They had to teach Jesus through the Old Testament. Thank God God had kept it perfect. And as he has preached Jesus fulfilled all the way through Scripture, he comes to verse 36 and he says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Do you get what he just said here to everybody who are here for this celebration, for this feast, who are here to be washed as they go into the temple? They're washed. They're going to be in these mikvahs around. They're there to show their repentance, to wash and to celebrate all around the southern side of the temple. And he's sitting there, he's looking at him, he said, God has called this Jesus whom you crucified, Lord and Messiah. What you've been praying for, what you've been looking for, what you've been hoping for has been fulfilled among us and we missed it and we crucified him. But hey, he meant to do this. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Two key pieces here. They were cut to the heart. We don't like getting cut to the heart. We might get a little scratch to the heart. But we don't like getting offended. But notice what they said. They were cut. And so instead of saying, what do we have to do? They say, what shall we do? At this moment, I want you to stop and think. You are standing. There are Roman officials around. There are, you're at the temple now. There are religious officials who have had Jesus crucified, and you're about to say something, bro, that is going to not make them happy. And Peter replies, repent and be baptized. Let's pause at the comma for a second. No problem. That's what we were here to do. We were going to repent. We were going to get immersed in the mikvah. We were going to have our ceremonial washing. That's great. You're not getting repentance, bro. It's not just saying you're sorry for what you've done. You're repenting of anything that's separating you from believing Jesus Christ as Lord, which can come down to the ceremonial practices you're here to do. It can make your family mad. It can make the religious leaders mad. It can make the government mad. Every one of you, not some of you, all of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, that's by the authority of Jesus Christ, not under the old covenant, not under John, under Jesus. Public enemy number one. That means, see, they knew death, burial, resurrection. I'm dying to my past. I'm being buried and I'm resurrecting in this new life and this new walk. And so I'm dying to everything that I've been and I'm being joined with Jesus now and I'm resurrecting in Jesus. He is my offering. I'm going through the sea of bronze so that I can dwell in his presence. That's pretty serious for these people. And then he goes deeper for the forgiveness of your sins not in the lambs but because of the blood of Jesus Christ you are being washed in his mikvah you are being baptized so your sins are cleansed and then check this out there's more now can you imagine right now the blasphemy that the religious leaders are thinking you're for the forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus no man can forgive sins and Peter's like, oh, there's one more piece. The Holy Spirit wants me to say this. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in man. Do you know how absurd that would be to them? And Peter is standing here boldly saying it. And then he says, this promise is for you. All right, so risk death, risk being banished, risk being put out by your family. This is for you and your children 
No, wait a minute, I could do it, but you, you mean my kids got to be in danger too? Yeah, you and your children and all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to that number that day. The first Pentecost, 3,000 died because of rebellion. This, this Pentecost, what we celebrate today, the birth of the church, the gospel message is preached, and 3,000 were baptized and added to the Lord's number. They found life. So Pentecost, the message is the same. It doesn't matter how we've changed over time. It doesn't matter how much we want to make it ours. The message is the same. God loves us so much he sent his only son. You are saved by grace through faith, but grace is the fact that there is blood that has been offered for you, but you must put it over your doorpost. You must be able to go through the mikvah. You must go through the Red Sea. Jesus is saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the sacrifice. Be washed in me to come to this. Pentecost was that message, and it wasn't easy. It was dangerous. If you'll stand with me today. Today we speak in your native language what you hear. Today we speak the word of God and the word of God in its purity, the fulfillment of all things is that you who cannot save yourself, I who cannot save myself has a savior who loved us so much that if we believe him, if we believe in him, then what he has told us to do is powerful and we will not perish because we believe in him and we follow him and we obey him. And in this he says, come into my sacrifice and be cleansed. Today maybe is your day to turn from things and be washed in Jesus. We're doing it to the river and we're doing it here, but we're going to sing as we sing, come, come, experience this new life. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He's my my strength, my song, this cornerstone. This solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What hearts of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ. I stand here in the love of Christ. I stand. Hey, Ecclesia, we've had a great day of worship and uh, praise, and it's just going to get better as the day goes on. We have three people today at this service giving their life to Christ and being baptized into his name. And then this afternoon we have 10 or 11, so don't miss this afternoon. It's going to be a great day for the Lord's Church today. So today I have with me right now uh, Mr. and Mrs. Larry Haft, Lu Ping, and Larry Haft, and they've decided to uh, be baptized today, and so I'm going to take their confession. Lu Ping speaks mostly Mandarin, but today she's going to say this confession in English, so let's uh, be supportive of her and just, let's say the confession with her. I believe. I believe. Jesus is God's Son. Lord and Savior. Lord and Savior. Today, Today, I give my life to Him. I give my life to Him. Awesome. Amen. And, and Larry's also confessed this today, and we wanted Lu Ping to do it publicly also. So, Lu Ping, proud of you. Thank you for being here today. I want to baptize Larry first, and I'll do you next, okay? Larry, because of your faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of all your sins, that you might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ping, because of your faith, because of your confession, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, 
the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of all your sins, that you might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're not done yet. I'm Reagan. I'm Kayla. Okay. Jesus is God's Son, Savior, Lord and Savior. And today, and today, I give my life to him. I give my life to him. Okay, so now I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of all your sins so that you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right, guys, stand up with us. So it was a little longer today, but it was worth it. We covered a lot. Of, let's come back to the present. Let's get back in our DeLoreans and make it here. Because the Great Commission is still here, and we're still the ones that are called to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he is with us. That is our call, to take him to them. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and in him is the presence of the Father, and we are equipped to go. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right. So as we get ready to unleash out of here, thank you for your time today, but thank you for the time you're going to put into others. We continue to sow. We bring our offerings. We bring our love. We bring our service. If today you are a part of God's family and you are contributing towards the kingdom, the future, and now you can go to ekkchurch.com slash give. You can give your tithes and offerings. There are boxes in the back and in the lobby. But we're asking each person in here, whether you're a part of here or a part of another church and you're just here today, then remember we are the church and we are his people and we are commissioned to go and we must carry the gospel. It is our call and it is how people know Jesus because they see him through us. You with me, church? Father God, you are good, you are holy, and you are mighty. Send us in the name of King Jesus, God. Send us as your harvest workers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you, church. Let's go change the world. Thank you for hanging with us to the very end of that message. Beautiful way to end that service, seeing people baptized into Jesus Christ, responding to that gospel call that Peter gave nearly 2,000 years ago on that first Pentecost, and we are still giving that call today. And we do want you to know that the invitation never closes. If you are ready to commit your life to Christ, you are ready to be baptized, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, to have your sins washed away, please reach out to us. You can call or text us at 843-443-7774, and we would love to be your church family and to walk with you through that. So thank you for being with us, and thank you for being part of this church family. If you are already connected to Ecclesia, we invite you to continue supporting the mission here. All the work that goes out from Ecclesia uh, is made possible because of our generosity. And if you would like to give, as Pastor Matt said, you can go to ekkchurch.com slash give and give your tithes and offerings in that way. We want to tell you about a few more things that are happening here and invite you to join in. We, this past week, finished our 365-day chronological Bible reading 
read through. So huge congratulations to everyone who finished reading the whole Word of God. And then the very next day, we jumped into our summer read through. So we are reading God's Word in 90 days over the summer. If you don't have access to that plan, you can text the word Bible to 855-721-1400. We'd be happy to send it to you. It's also in the Bible app under Whole Bible Plans. It's called Every Word, a 90-day reader's guide to the entire Bible. So we invite you to be part of that. If you're a lady, I want to personally invite you to a time of fellowship that we are going to be having every Monday this summer, excluding July the 4th for the 13 weeks of this reading plan. We're going to get together over at the Hub in person from 5 to 6 p.m. on Mondays just for a time of fellowship around our Bible reading plan, some accountability to help keep us on track, and even Q&A if you want to just unpack what you're reading in the Bible that week. So all women, you are invited to that. And men and women, I want to invite you to be part of Ecclesia's core class. So that is starting on June the 20th. It's five weeks, five Mondays over the summer, again, excluding July the 4th. And we're going just to be talking about some of the essential beliefs of the Lord's church. What does the church look like in scripture? What is the mission and purpose of the church? And how can we look like that as the Lord's church today? This class is also a requirement for anyone who would like to serve in a leadership position here, uh, deacons, team leaders, pastoral staff, that come and be part of that class if you're interested in taking a step in that direction. And to be part of that, you can text the word CORE to 855-721-1400. So please join us for that. And importantly, we want to remind you, join us today at the river. If you're here in Conway, Myrtle Beach on the Grand Strand area, we will be down at the Riverfront Park, the Conway Marina from 4 to 6 p.m. We will be setting up before that. If you'd like to come jump in and help out, we would love all the helping hands. And from 4 to 6, we'll have music. We'll have a message. We will have food. We're going to have a big cookout. And many people have chosen to be baptized in the river today. So we're going to enjoy that and we're going to witness that with them. So you are all welcome to come be part of it. Guys, it's a great day. Happy birthday to the Lord's Church, the day of Pentecost. I'm going to pray us out now and then we are going to launch out into the commission that Christ has sent us on. So pray with me. God, thank you so much for your church. God, this beautiful plan for how your people live together in community, Lord. Thank you for giving us a commission in this plan so that we can go out and reach other people for you. God, we thank you for your salvation. We thank you for the invitation to come to that. And God, I pray that you would help us to all be good stewards of your commission, Lord, that we would love people and see people the way that you love and see people and that we would pursue them, God, with your love so that many would be brought to you. God, thank you for this church family. We love you so much, and we're so thankful for all you're doing here. God, please continue to work in the miraculous ways that you do. God, thank you for letting us be part of it. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you guys, and we will see you next week. Until then, go change the world.